السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما ثنيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقرة عيوننا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله it's a great, great honor and pleasure to join everyone this evening uh, on this uh, uh, broadcast, for lack of a better word right now. We pray that Allah makes it a source of great benefit. It's good to uh, reach out, to be able to uh, uh, check in on each other, check in with each other. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety. Some folks are losing their jobs. Uh, some folks are losing uh, their health. And uh, there's uh, a great, great effort to really prevent the kind of situation that we see in Northern Italy right now, or that we see in Iran right now, which is worse than Italy. I Iran, what's happening is a disaster. It's just not, the government is not really publicizing nor giving accurate uh, numbers to reflect the scope of that disaster. Uh, I talked to a friend of mine who is Iranian pulmonologist, and that they're really going through hard times. We should pray for them. Uh, these are times that uh, we we get real with ourselves, and whenever we get real, we can see just how uh, petty a lot of the things that formally preoccupy us really, really are. And so I think one of the greatest benefits, I think Sheikh Muslim I mentioned many benefits, may Allah preserve her and her husband, her family and protect them. Uh, she mentioned many, but we can add to the list of the wonderful things that, that she mentioned, the opportunity to see reality for what it is. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan. Ya Allah, show us truth as truth and bless us, bless us to follow it. So we see the truth of what this life is all about. At the end of the day, it's about family. And so we neglect our families. And now we have an opportunity to really see just how real and how valuable family actually is. It's about community. Many of us we can enjoy this virtual community, but a lot of folks are isolated in their homes and their, their ties to their wider community have been cut. And now they really, really value community. We see the, the value of life. One of our, uh, the great objectives of our religion is preserving life. Hifthul deen, hifthul deen, hifthul hayat, hifthul aqal. والنسل والمال والعرض uh, protecting deen protecting life these are ordered protecting the intellect so protecting deen and to towards that end for example kufr and shirk have been prohibited protecting life murder has been prohibited protecting intellect intoxicants have been prohibited protecting family fornication adultery have been, been prohibited protecting wealth, interest, uh, insider trading, monopoly, hoarding, all of these uh, debt selling, except in the Shafi school. These things have been prohibited, ird, backbiting, slander, namima, tell, scandal mongering. All these things have been pre prohibited to protect honor. So way up is the protection of life. First is religion. Uh, there was a recent controversy in Egypt. One of the scholars wrote a lengthy article about the protection of life should be first. But the argument for religion, without religion, life is not worth living. Without religion, true religion, without deen, life is not worth living. 
And so protecting Dean is number one because the meaning comes before the physical manifestation of things. And religion provides the deepest and richest meanings to life itself. In other words, without religion, life is meaningless. And that nihilism is part of the, the problem that we have right now. So it's very good to, to have an opportunity to see the reality of what this life is all about and to enjoy those things that we were too busy or too preoccupied to really enjoy before this crisis set. And of course, uh, uh, it's not the best way under these circumstances to enjoy those things but and to realize the, the value of those things, but it is what it is, as they say. You know, one way I look at this is, uh, I don't know if it's Star Wars or Star Trek or one of those. I, I don't watch Star Trek. I, I got involved with Star Wars. My mother-in-law was visiting. She lives with us now. And, but several years ago, she was visiting and she wanted to see a movie. And so we're not regular moviegoers. So we looked for what's playing and they all seemed to be raunchy. And the thing was, then there was Star Wars. It's okay, we'll take her to see Star Wars. And, and then I, I got introduced to Star Wars. Uh, anyway, Allahumma uh, salli ala rasulillah. Uh, but but we have we have uh, an opportunity. Okay, okay, yeah, the point. So I think one of the Star Wars, or maybe it was, but I, it's in my mind. The Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back. And one of these things, if is in fact, as the scientists say, I have no uh, reason to doubt it. Or oh, was Star Wars? The Empire Strikes Back. Thank you, uh, my dear brother or sister who introduced that note. I just glanced at it. I didn't catch your name. Uh, that it comes from the animals, right? Uh, we could say the animals strike back. I mean, look, look what we've done to the animals. Like recently, right, there's an article from uh, 1900 to now, nine billion birds have disappeared, killed the birds. Uh, we're getting so much tick infestation because we've destroyed the animals' habitats and the animals that do remain are in such close proximity to humans that there are now ticks and Lyme disease and all these other diseases. Uh, We've, we've killed off 90% of the fish stocks in the oceans. This is one of the things that uh, was predicted to happen at the end of time. So a verse that many people are reciting these days, that corruption has appeared in the land and the sea owing to what the hands of humans have wrought. Thus do we give them a taste of what they have done in order that they return. And so corruption in the sea, uh, Ibn Abbas mentioned that the sea would cease giving its harvest. So the seafood would dry up. And so 90% of the fish stocks have been depleted. Yellowfin tuna, bluefin tuna, all on the verge of extinction. Uh, so look, we're, we're approaching what some call the sixth great mass extinction. Uh, the, the difference, all of the previous five were natural disasters. The meteor strike uh, destroyed the dinosaurs. The Ice Age, the advent of the Ice Age killed off the saber-toothed tiger and the woolly mammoth. But now it's a man-made. And, and some people refer to this era as the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, where humans have the ability to destroy all life on Earth. And so... I, I see in one way, the animals are striking back. Say, look what you've done to us. And warning us, and as, as was mentioned by Sheikh al-Muslima, after this warning, are we going to change our ways? Are we going to try to have a smaller ecological footprint? Are we going to try to engage in practices that encourage greater sustainability? Or are we going to just, as the deaths die down and things return to normal and the virus is declared to be eradicated, 
are we going to return to normal? The, the air over China now, there's the, the clouds of toxic gases that probably kill far more people of respiratory problem, uh, issues such as asthma are no longer there. The satellite images that show the nitric oxide and the sulfuric dioxide, all these other things falling there, it, it's clear right now. The canals in Venice are cleared up. The water is blue. The fish and the dolphins are coming back into the city. Are we going to just return? Are we going to return to business as usual? Are we going to return to, and, and all of us have a part to play. Now, I know someone personally, everything that you, every bit of advice you give uh, to warn them against some negative uh, practices that have either negative social or ecological consequences. So oh, you're just one person. What difference are you going to make? You know, many of you know the story of the boy with the starfish. So there was a big storm and thousands of starfish were walk, uh, washed up onto the beach. And uh, uh, this little boy saw the starfish and he realized they were going to dry up in the sun and die. So he went down to the beach and he started throwing them back into the ocean, one by one, one by one, one by one. And there was a man that, he, an old man was watching the boy and he said, this boy will never throw all the starfish back. Well, what's he doing? And so he goes down to the boy and he says, son, I've been watching you and, you know, you're really uh, doing a good thing, but there's no way you're going to save all of these starfish. And they said the little boy looked up at the man with firm resolve, he reached down, he grabbed the starfish and he threw it back into the ocean. And he said, I saved that one. I say that one. And so the little things we do add up. The little things we do add up. Uh, I was in Vancouver hiking many years, probably a decade ago, in British Columbia during the rainy season. And uh, there, was a, it was a, there was a river, it wasn't that wide. It was maybe 30 yards across. It wasn't like the Missouri or the Mississippi or something like that, but it was maybe 30 meters across. But the current was just roaring down the water was coming down from the mountain and i said subhanallah if someone fell in there they're gone because it's just a raging current and then i reflected that somewhere way up in those mountains that roaring raging river with this huge volume of water even though it wasn't that wide but just the volume of water was unbelievable somewhere way up in the mountain it started as a single drop of rain or a single drop of melting snow. And then that drop joined with others and those drops joined with others and they formed little creeks and streams and brooks and rivulets and then they came together and they formed larger streams and then they all merged into this great ocean. So we should never underestimate the power we have as individuals if we're doing something good and proper. We can come together and make a big difference on this planet. And so if this uh, crisis we find ourselves in is a wake up call in that regard, then that's how we should, we should see it. We should commit ourselves to doing our part and then pray that Allah uses us as one of those drops of water. And he uses the next brother, the next sister, the next brother, the next sister. And before you know it, we're that mighty river that can sweep away the negativity, sweep, sweep away the greed, Look at our system, right? We talk about being so wealthy, but why, do, why are doctors in danger? Uh, there's a term I'll never use again. Sometimes being uh, old school firebrand, I cooled off a lot. Uh, you know, I would say the hypocritical oath that many of these doctors, they're just in it to make money or they should change the Hippocratical to the hypocritical. But seeing the courage and the sacrifice of our doctors and our medical uh, professionals, the nurses, uh, the other caregivers, the workers in uh, uh, convalescent homes and uh, skill, uh, uh, the assisted living facilities, and the sacrifices they're making with inadequate equipment. Why don't they have masks? 
Why don't they have adequate scrubs? Why don't they have adequate uh, goggles and protection against this sort of virus? Because it's not profitable. It's not profitable. Things are made to be sold and that the, the stockholders demand the greatest uh, profit, uh, debt profit, debt loss ratios possible. So every ounce of profit is squeezed out of an enterprise. It's not profitable to stockpile things. It's not profitable. And so we have to change the way we, we look at our economy. We have to change the way we look at our environment. We have to change the way we look at each other because uh, the underlying message and a lot of what's happening is that there were large groups of people that were deemed to be expendable. It's that simple. And we see that happening in, in Italy, and not by design, but as a matter of fact, where because there was not adequate uh, wherewithal to treat an aging population, now they have to make that frightening, painful, awesome decision to just not treat people, just let them die. Because of, there has to be triage. So we have to save those with the greatest chance of, of, of living and fighting through this. So those are decisions we, we shouldn't have to make. But the only way we're not going to have to make such decisions is to change the way that we view each other. And alhamdulillah, you want another benefit from the virus? It, it stopped the violence in India because they realized that preparing for this threat is more dangerous than the threat uh, posed by this imaginary Muslim boogeyman. And no one's thinking about scapegoating the Muslims when their very lives are at risk because of this, this virus. And so again, it shouldn't take a virus to spark us into ecological consciousness. It shouldn't take a virus to make us to begin uh, reassessing uh, the way we operate economically. It shouldn't, it shouldn't take a virus to bring about the positive things that we see happening. So may Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq and taysir and kabul. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala bless us to really turn to Him. So the verse, la'alhum yarji'oon, that perhaps they will return. They will return back to Allah, return back to the remembrance of Allah, return back to the sincere worship of Allah, return back to the, the wonderful, uh, uh, rulings of the religion, many of which would protect against these things. Like Muslims, we don't eat bats and rats and snakes and weasels and these things that are sold in these, these wet markets. Those creatures are free to go in the wild and live their lives and not be crammed together. Uh, we don't slaughter animals in the presence of others. These animals are killed in front of each other. We, we hide the animal being slaughtered because these are sentient creatures. So one person, I want that ferret. And you grab the ferret out of this cave and kill it and skin it and cut it up. And the others are looking and horrified. And so these, these, these are all things forbidden in Islam. And not, not to say that the, these practices are, uh, are necessarily going to prevent these sort of scourges, but they go a long way towards creating a spiritual environment that wards off evil from us. And so I'll conclude with this, one of the greatest du'as we can say to protect ourselves in these times. A'udhu bi kalimati Allah tammati min sharri ma khalaq. A'udhu bi kalimati Allah tammati min sharri ma khalaq. A'udhu bi kalimati Allah tammati min sharri ma khalaq. I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the uh, badness or evil of what he has created. So the perfect word of Allah is kun, be. And with that word be, kun, all of the hardships that we are experience can be eradicated. May Allah give us tawfiq, taysir, and kabul. May Allah bless you, bless the organizers for bringing everyone together. And may Allah Ta'ala bless all of you to enjoy the blessings of family, enjoy the blessings of quiet, 
enjoy the blessings of dhikr, remembrance of Allah, enjoy the blessings of the Quran, enjoy the blessings of family, enjoy the blessings of the outdoors. We can still go outdoors and we can walk and keep a, a safe distance uh, from others and just en enjoy the spring, the blessings of the spring. Think how depressing this would happen, would be if it happened during the onset of winter. And we had to look forward to fighting the virus as we hunkered down in the, the doom and gloom of winter, but it's happening in the spring. So we can still see the flowers blooming. We can see new life, even when death or the threat of death or the apprehension of death is all around us. We can be inspired by the new life that the spring ushers in. So may Allah give us tawfiq. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Barakatuh.